Today we come to the fifth installment of our current sermon series that I've entitled First Peter, Finding Your Place in a World Gone Crazy. And you'll remember that Peter is writing to Christians who live in the area known as Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And they have been scattered. Their world has been turned upside down. They are experiencing persecution from the state and they're also experiencing persecution from society in general. So what Peter is doing here in this short little letter is he's giving them practical lessons on how they can thrive in a hostile, chaotic world. Their situation, I believe, mirrors our situation. I think the last six months has shown us that we too are living in a world gone crazy. Now, when I was designing the graphic for this series, I intentionally included a picture of a dumpster fire. I put that on there intentionally. Mark enlarge that picture for me. I did the picture of the dumpster fire because I thought that was a great illustration of how most of us, many of us, feel about 2020. And when we think over the past six, seven months, folks, we understand that injustice and racism are fueling the fire. Alt-right groups are fueling the fire. Rioting is fueling the fire. Political propaganda, and folks, it's coming from both sides of the aisle. It is fueling the fire. Certainly, without being said, COVID-19 is fueling the fire. And many of you all know this. We know this as church leaders. Those of you involved with the school system know. Right now, trying to make decisions, trying to plan for the future, <laughs> is adding fuel to the fire. And then you get person A passing judgment on person B because person B is not behaving the way that person A thinks that everybody should behave. Well, folks, that kind of thing, it's adding fuel to the fire. And men and women, all of this is exhausting. It is sucking the joy right out of our lives. It is consuming uh, our sense of peace. It is, it is consuming our sense of stability. So the big question of this series, the big question of this series that I have kept at the forefront as I have studied Peter's words is how does a child of God find their place in a world gone crazy? That's the instruction that Peter is giving to his readers. And that's what Peter has been telling us. He has been giving us, matter of fact, rubber meets the road instruction for that very thing. Now, i got to say that today and next week, Peter is going to drill in deep. Probably today, definitely next week will be the most uncomfortable things that he has to say to us in this series. In fact, in advanced preparation, in advanced study of next week's sermon, I've entitled it, Heads Up Exiles, You're Not Going to Like This Sermon. So that's going to give you a lot of anticipation for what's coming next week. So folks, how does a child of God find their place in a world gone crazy? Well, in today's text, Peter is going to tell us that there are uh, two changes. That there must be two changes that we make to our perspective. And these two changes are not going to be optional. They are musts. They're absolutes. They're necessities. They are requirements. And so Peter is teaching us here that the bottom line reality is if we're not willing to change our perspective in these two ways, we will not thrive in this crazy world. So Peter's going to teach us that if we're not willing to change the way we see things in these two areas, in these two ways, folks, we're just going to limp along. 
Our spiritual vitality is going to suffer. If we don't make these two changes, the crazy world around us is going to eat us alive. So look at 1 Peter 2 there, verse 11. Peter says there, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So notice there in the verse, look at it as I'm talking. Peter again reminds us that we are living in the in-between. We are God's people who are living in the in-between time between Genesis 3, the fall of creation, and Revelation 21, when God restores everything back to its rightful place. Paul reminded us elsewhere, didn't he? He reminded us in Philippians of this same thought. That our citizenship ultimately isn't here on earth. Paul reminded us that our citizenship is in heaven. So Peter comes to us this morning and he says... As foreigners, as strangers, as pilgrims, as exiles, he says we must vastly, uh, we must live a vastly different lifestyle than the world around us. So folks, that's the first necessary change. The first necessary change to thrive in this world gone crazy is that we must crucify our ongoing need for instant gratification. We must slay our ongoing need for instant gratification. Remember there Peter said abstain. From sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Now, now John says the same thing over in his little letter, 1 John 2.15. John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Now, let me stop here and say, let me stop here and be clear. Neither Peter nor John is saying that Christians should be prudes. That Christians should be monks or killjoys. Folks, they're not advocating that we live some kind of Amish lifestyle. That's not the point that they are making here. The point is, lesson number one. What Peter and John is warning about is us having an affair, if you will, with the world that replaces our relationship with God. John continues in 1 John He says in verse 16 of chapter 2, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now what John does there is he gives us these three sinful forces in the world that's always competing with God to be our master. First there, he talks about the lust of the flesh. Folks, the lust of the flesh says to our souls every day, it says, feel good right now. Ignore the price. Don't miss the opportunity. The the lust of the flesh is constantly telling us that the gratification of our physical desires is the only way to be happy. The lust of the flesh is about unlimited and uninhibited pleasure. Secondly, the lust of the eyes that John mentions. It says to our hearts every day, for you to experience physical pleasure, you have to have X, Y, and Z. For you to get physical pleasure, you have to chase after the car, the home, the clothes, the ATV, the vacation, the relationship, the person. This is what fuels jealousy and bitterness among us. Now, the lust of the eyes provides what is needed to give the lust of the flesh its physical pleasure. And then Paul, uh, John talks about the pride of life. The pride of life says to our minds every day, to have worth, you must be superior. Everything must be about you. 
You must be better. You must be smarter. You must have the attention. You must accomplish this. You must get your way. You must have more likes on social media than everybody else does. Folks, the, the, the pride of life provides what is needed to give the lust of the flesh its emotional pleasure. Now, lesson number two. Ladies and gentlemen, these three sinful forces wage war against our soul. They murder our relationship with God because here it is. We are investing far more time, effort, and resources into them than we are into the Lord God Almighty. And this is exactly what Yahweh God meant when He said, You shall have no other gods before Me. This is exactly what Jesus Christ meant when He said, You cannot serve two masters. This is exactly what James meant when he said, don't you know that friendship with the world makes you, do you know the rest of what James says there? Friendship with the world makes you what? An enemy of God. But now folks, some Christians, some Christians, maybe some of you this morning or some of you watching, some Christians are all about feeling good right now. That instant gratification demon is always on their shoulder telling them to do whatever it takes to get the instant pleasure hit. Relax, have fun, kick back and enjoy yourself. Indulge in food, drink, leisure, sex, the creature comforts of life whenever and wherever you can. And there's some Christians... They're not so much driven by the impulses of the moment, but they're driven by what they want in the future. The degree, the job, the income, the victory. So they study hard now, train hard now. They throw every dime into savings. They live like a miser now so they can get this or that in the future. And church being ruled by the impulses of our body will murder our soul. Now, I need to make sure that I'm not misunderstood. Uh, many, ladies and gentlemen, if not all, of the examples I have given, such as food, leisure, creature comforts, folks, they're not in and of themselves sinful. Peter's not saying, John's not saying, just dump those things all together. Peter is not calling us to abandon all of those things and live a miserable life. The issue is priority. The issue is priority. I need you to get that. You repeat that with me? The issue is what? Priority. One more time. The issue is priority. Priority. You see, little Prater, if we are pursuing these things with a greater intensity than we are pursuing the Lord God Almighty, these things have become idols. These things have become little gods, little g. These things then become sinful. Look at verse 12. There, Peter says, Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. So then here is the second necessary change. Folks, we must stop worrying about the impact any given situation will have on us and we must start figuring out how we can glorify God and magnify the gospel in it. Now that's a big statement, isn't it? Oh, come on. Do your head like this. How about we read this again? We must stop worrying about the impact any given situation is going to have on us 
And we need to start figuring out how in any of those given situations we can glorify God and magnify the gospel through it. Folks, because we are exiles living in a fallen world, we're always going to encounter difficult situations. We're always going to encounter difficult relationships. In fact, that's the area that Peter focuses on throughout the rest of this chapter and the next chapter. In fact, throughout the rest of this chapter and the next chapter, Peter mentions three There's being subject to the leadership of non-Christian and unjust rulers. There's being in the employment and under the control of an unjust boss or master. He also talks about being married to a sinful person. Now, i got to tell you, I'm going to end this particular series next week so I can start another series the following Sunday, and it's going to flow out of our study in Romans. And I need to time it right now. So because of that, I can go, uh, I can't go into these in detail. And next week, the one I said the sermon we're not going to like, we're going to talk about being subject to the leadership of non-Christian or unjust rulers because that's what Peter talks about here. But this morning, I'm focusing on the big picture of all three types of relationships. Now, lesson number three. Folks, Peter tells us in verse 12 that we need to change our perspective on what the purpose of our lives is. For a resident of the world, what matters most to them is how everything around them affects them. For someone who is a Christian who is a citizen of heaven, Peter says here, what matters most is how their situations advance the kingdom of God. And so Peter is teaching us as strangers and exiles who are living in the in-between, Peter says that we must view our lives through the lens of God's kingdom. In all situations, Peter is teaching us here, we must be asking, how can I glorify God and point people to the gospel? In all situations, Peter is saying, we must ask the question, how can I use this to glorify God and point people to the gospel? Look again at verse 12 there. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that... Then look at that next phrase. Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Now notice the phrase there again, though they accuse you of doing wrong. The New American Standard, if you're reading out of that, the phrase there is they slander you as evildoers. The King James there says they speak against you as evildoers. Now what I find interesting by Peter's statement right there, is lesson number four. Folks, Peter expects us to be slandered and mistreated. Peter expects us to be slandered and mistreated. And this was literally happening in Peter's day. The early Roman world did not understand Christians and they felt threatened by them. And as a result, they would often twist the truth and they would often downright lie about this group of people known as Christians. Uh, The gossip, the, the, the slander that, that went throughout the Roman world was that Christians were superstitious. Oh, you better watch out. They're superstitious. Well... They called them superstitious because they believed in miracles. Or those Christians, that bunch, oh, they're incestuous. Well, they called them incestuous because they married their, quote, brothers and sisters. Because that's how they viewed each other, brothers and sisters in in the Lord. They They were atheists. They called them atheists because they denied Roman gods. I like this one. They were They were cannibals. Because they were eating flesh and drinking blood when they got together in assembly. 
And folks, Christians were the preferred scapegoats for every single problem in society. When Nero burned Rome, he blamed the Christians. When outside forces would attack the Roman state, it was always the Christians' fault. Folks, the slander, the pop propaganda against Christians in the Roman world was vicious. And Peter comes to these Christians and he says, you know what? You should expect this. This is what they've done to Jesus. Now, don't let this take you by surprise. This is going to happen. And folks, the same is true about us as well. When Christians are attacked, we should not be surprised. They, it was done to Jesus, it's going to be done to us. And what Peter says here is, listen, it was done to Jesus and I need you to see, Peter says, I need you to understand how Jesus reacted to the slander. How Jesus reacted to the persecution. How Jesus reacted to the propaganda against Him. Notice what Peter says. Verse 21 there. He says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you. He was leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. So then how did Jesus respond to a world gone crazy? Well, first of all, folks, Jesus was patient. Listen, friends, we've got to crucify the notion that if we live right, nothing bad will ever happen to us. It certainly didn't happen that way for Jesus. If we think that living right insulates us from injustice and suffering, then we're not following the true Savior of the world. Peter said there in verse 23, he says, They hurled their insults at Him, yet He did not retaliate, when he suffered, he made no threats. That's a tall order, friends. Do we want to thrive in this world gone crazy? Do we want to follow the example of Jesus Christ? Well, that's going to mean that we've got to be patient. Be kind. Be gentle. That means sometimes we've got to back off. Bite our tongues. That means we need to forgive. Many times that means that we just need to move on. Secondly, Jesus relied on His Father for vindication. He knew that Him who judges justly would exonerate Him and honor Him. Folks, Jesus knew that He was a stranger and an exile in a world gone crazy. He knew that His home was in another time and another place. Jesus knew that His kingdom was another type of kingdom altogether. Peter said that Jesus, in verse 23, the second part, entrusted Himself to Him who judges justly. Well, who is Him who judges justly? That's His heaven. Heavenly Father. So folks, do you want to thrive in a world gone crazy? Well, if you do, you've got to take the long view. You've got to keep your eyes on God. You've got to remind yourself daily of the throne room scenes in Revelation because that reminds us that God is still in charge. You have to remind yourself daily that God gets the last word. That God will vindicate everything. We have to keep that, friends, in the forefront of our minds. Jesus did. Jesus did. Thirdly, Jesus kept doing good even while being slandered. Jesus kept doing good even while being slandered. He kept on doing miracles. He kept on teaching. He even offered forgiveness while hanging on the cross. Folks, Jesus took the long view, the heavenly view, and He let His good works speak for themselves. I want you to notice Peter's instruction, His direct command there in verse 12 again. He says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, now look at this, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. You see that? They may see your good deeds and glorify God. How will they glorify God? By our good deeds. Right? 
Folks, what Peter is saying here is that good deeds render slander and persecution impotent. Not picket signs. Good deeds. Not social media posts. Good deeds. Not ranting and ravings. Good deeds. Not necessarily having a government that is tolerant of our beliefs. No. Good deeds. You know, with the latest hurricane making landfall in the south in the past couple of days, I've already noticed that the phrase, thoughts and prayers, is being thrown around again. And in the recent past, the sinful society around us has been extremely critical of that phrase. And it's extremely critical because it doesn't understand the spiritual benefits and the power of prayer. Uh, It sees the church, it sees the Christians as being all bark and no bite. It sees the church, it sees Christians as being hypocritical, hypocritical because there's no action backing up their words. So ladies and gentlemen, the point that Peter is making here is that sinful society may not understand prayer, but it understands teams of volunteers showing up to help clean up and rebuild. A sinful society understands donations of food, water, clothing, and money. James, the half-brother of Jesus and key leader in the early church, said over in James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Folks, the church is God's first responder. The church is God's change agent. The church is the way God gets things accomplished on earth. So do we want to thrive? Do we want to influence a world that has gone crazy? We need to do good works in the name of Jesus. We need to do them often. Do them even when people don't deserve them. We imitate the example of our Lord and Savior. Fourthly, Jesus saved us through His suffering. Jesus saved us through His suffering. Notice what Peter says there. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds, he's he's quoting Isaiah here, by His wounds, Peter says, you have been healed. (laughs) Folks, Jesus' wounds were not collateral damage. Uh, they were the very means by which we were saved. And folks, i got to tell you here, I don't fully understand it. And it is indeed wonderfully mysterious. But Peter is teaching us here that just as Jesus purchased salvation for the world through His suffering and wounds, in the same way through our suffering, we will introduce the world to that very salvation that Jesus has provided for it. Our persecutions, our sufferings, all of the situations that we find ourselves in, in a world gone crazy, if properly used, ladies and gentlemen, will point an unsaved world to the gospel of the living Christ. So again, I ask, do you want to thrive in a world gone crazy? Well, Peter says here, if you do, then live a life that allows God to redeem your pain and use your pain. Live a life that declares, not everything is about me. Live a life that seeks to glorify God and spread the gospel in every situation. You know why Peter, by the way, hits that one first? Uh, He goes against sinful desires, instant gratification, living a life that's not about us. We have to declare that. Because, folks, we're never going to get to a point 
where our life or the situations we encounter in a world gone crazy, we'll never get to the place in our lives where we'll seek to glorify God and we'll seek to spread the gospel in every situation we find ourselves because we're too wrapped up in us. We're too wrapped up about the big I and the big me. We're too worried about me to worry about God. We're too worried about me to worry about the gospel. So Peter has to start with that first. He says, listen, you've got to crucify yourself. I imagine in Peter's words where Jesus, uh, where Paul's words, it says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but what's the rest of that? It is Christ who lives in me. Finally, folks, let me tell you one more thing. Peter uses an interesting word in verse 21. Look at verse 21. He says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. Now, obviously example is the word there. I've got it highlighted. <clears throat> the Greek word for example is... Hupo grandmas. And it means to write. W-R-I-T-E. It means to copy. Uh, we get our word grammar from it. Uh, children are taught to write today much the same way Greek parents taught their children to write in Peter's day. Uh, parents or instructors in Peter's day would take a sheet of paper and they would very, very lightly just write out the Greek letters, write out the Greek alphabet, write out words. Then they would take another sheet of paper that was very, very thin and they'd lay on top of that paper that they just wrote on and then they would have their child sit down and hupo grandmas that trace over the letters, the words and the sentences that they had written. And so Peter takes that image. He takes that idea of hupogrammos. And he says, listen, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you. And you need to do hupogrammos so that you should follow in His steps. And folks, what Peter is saying there is that we should lay down Jesus Christ's example and trace over His response with our response. We do exactly what He did. We imitate the action of Jesus Christ. Big word, big word there. And Peter using the word example. <clears throat> Folks, I get, I get, I get. We, we, we go through Peter... You know, Peter doesn't give us that instant appeal. Uh, Peter doesn't give us just that one thing that will make everything easier. You'll notice as you go through his letter, what Peter does constantly is he is calling us to draw closer to Jesus Christ and imitate, copy his example. Folks, Jesus Christ is the only true thing. Jesus Christ is the only thing with substance that's going to give us victory in a world gone crazy. And you know, the more I've read this book, that victory may not be instant. That victory may not fix all of the problems we encounter. But that victory grows us up in our faith it draws us closer to God and it makes us useful for the kingdom of God. That's how Peter defines victory. Let's pray.